Before we get started today, I just wanted to mention that this presentation and the corresponding slides are copyrighted by Robson Forensic, and they may not be recorded, copied, distributed, or otherwise used without authorization. That being said, if you find the information that's shared today to be helpful, and you'd like to arrange for a smaller, more intimate uh, webinar or presentation with your firm or your legal, your regional legal organization, we can usually do that and especially coordinating these events through Zoom. In all likelihood, we can do it at no cost. So reach out to us if you have a, a particular topic that you'd like to see covered. Let us know. Uh, chances are we can accommodate that request. So on to today's program on identifying problem drivers. The first speaker we have lined up for you today is Brooks Ruggemer, uh, the head of our trucking operations practice. And Brooks, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, there you are. Uh, we'll make sure that, you, that your slides pop up on the screen. Now, Brooks, you've been with the firm since 2005, and, and you're now the head of our trucking operations practice. And I, I think it's people like you that, that really allow Robson Forensic to be the firm that we are, because having somebody on staff who's investigated hundreds of cases allows us to onboard new experts. Sorry, Siri's trying to talk to me over here. It allows us to onboard new experts who have 20, 30, 40 years experience in industry, and you're able to coach them on the forensic aspects of, of what you do and how to apply all of that industry expertise that they've, that they've built up to this new career as, as an expert witness. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and also the, the trucking operations practice? Sure, Jesse. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Brooks with Robson Forensic. I run the trucking and warehousing practice for Robson. <clears throat> as Jesse said, I've been here since 2005. I work close to a thousand cases. I've been deposed about 140 times and I've testified in trial about 30. Um, it's, it's, Robson's a great firm to be with. I've learned a lot from some very talented and, 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 and supremely uh, high-end people in their fields. Uh, as I put my team together, the truck team for Robson, I, I went to the industry, I went to people that I know and, and the, the, the industry that I'm familiar with to choose these people. Uh, in my background, I have 12 years and about a million point four miles of accident-free driving. I have 13 years of experience in all aspects of motor carrier management and 13 years experience uh, in CDL driver hiring qualifications and I've hired about 5,000 uh, drivers to date. Um, my team, I have four members of my team, uh, myself, Tim Buzzard, uh, who was supposed to be part of our presentation today, but uh, had a client emergency he had to go take care of, Jeff Bosger and Mark Respis, who you will hear from today. Uh, all of my team, uh, all of my truck team here at Robson are former drivers. We have accumulated close to 40, um, 40 years of professional driving. We have over seven years of combined uh, trucking and warehousing safety management. And together we've hired maybe 13,000 drivers. It's a good team. I insisted that when someone applies with my firm or we find people to, to join our truck group, that they are former drivers. There's something to be said for having a million miles or more behind the wheel of a truck, which gives you a deeper insight into what we do. And I think it makes us better experts for you. Uh, besides the typical truck crash case and the driver qualification cases, my team has a wide range of experience in trucking. We have people that are experienced with tanker operations and flatbed operations, doubles and triples. We have uh, multi-stop delivery specialists. Um, we do a lot of warehouse operations work, forklift accidents. I do a lot of loading dock accidents where, where the forklift goes off of the dock. I, I have maybe a dozen of them right now. We do a lot of cargo handling cases you know, re regarding accident and injury and sometimes death. I have over the years done a lot of flatbed related work, drivers falling from the tops of flatbeds or being knocked from the tops of flatbeds. We do a lot of work with distribution centers, the big Walmarts and the Costco distribution centers. And I have a heavy 
uh, background in OSHA reg in, in regards to trucking operations. People don't think of OSHA when you think about trucking, but there is an influence and a connection between the two. So today, we're gonna talk about identifying problem drivers and how these drivers keep getting into the truck. We're gonna come at it from three different perspectives today. I'm going to talk about how these drivers keep getting into the truck and the costs of hiring and losing drivers and how that affects what drivers get into the truck. Mark Respis, who's in our Denver office, will talk about pre-screening the drivers and the critical combination of having a risk management program that goes along with your federal motor carrier compliance program. And as I said, Tim uh, can't be with us today. He's, he's dealing with a client uh, uh, emergency due to travel with, with the, the, the COVID situation around us. But I'm going to cover his part about non-CDL drivers. There's a, a large fleet of people out there that drive vehicles that are not CDL holders, but they're still driving uh, as part of their job. And I did those cases and I helped Tim develop that practice. So I'm going to give his information uh, as we get started. So if you do trucking work, whether you do plaintiff work or defense work, we know what the Q file is, the driver qualification file. You can follow the step-by-step -step standards in section 391 of the Federal Motor Carrier Regs. In, in more plain terms, it involves a completed application with all the background employment information. It involves pulling the driver's MBR, making sure the driver's DOT qualified, DOT medical qualified, so we're either sending them to the clinic or make sure they have a, a, an up-to-date uh, medical card. We all know about the drug and alcohol pre-screening process. The prior employment verification must do three years whether that driver is digging a ditch or driving a truck, anything they've done in the prior three years must be verified. And in that three years of employment, you must obtain their prior drug and alcohol test results. So the cost of an empty truck, why has there been a push for decades uh, to put drivers in the trucks? We hear about this driver shortage. And this topic has been one of the most sought after topics when, when people and groups uh, come to us for speakers. The typical truck generates $800 to $1,000 a day of revenue. The typical truck has about $125 a day of, of fixed overhead costs. Those are your payments, your insurance, your taxes, maintenance and escrow. Uh, you have depreciation that you have to factor into the value of the truck. What's not included in this is the daily fuel consumption and the pay for the driver. Uh, it's nothing for a truck to uh, burn 260 or more dollars worth of fuel a day. And a driver is making $200, give or take, a day. So it, it's, it's an expensive business to be in. And when a truck is not running, there's a lot of revenue that is not being made. What are we talking about here? One of the major carriers in the industry advertises having 10,500 trucks but they're showing having 10,000 drivers. So they have 500 trucks that are sitting empty at the fence. That's roughly 40 to $50,000 a day in lost revenue and about $15 million of lost revenue per year. So that, that's a big chunk of a company's uh, revenue and you're still paying the expenses for those trucks that are just sitting there. So orientation, when you hire drivers, uh, you're putting a driver on the, on the payroll is a two part process. We hire them the same way we are all hired at our jobs or the way we've hired employees at our jobs. Then the driver must be qualified. And Mark will talk some more about the qualification process. Uh, the qualification is typically performed during the orientation. There, there will be uh, a staff of safety clerks that are contacting former employers and, and gathering the documents needed to put the Q file together. It's during this time that the negative information is, is discovered and from then your your classes start to shrink. The typical orientation class with the big carriers is a three to five day affair. They cover company policies and procedures. They go through logbook training, even that's electronic logs today. Every company has a system that they use and they want to make sure their drivers understand that system or they should be providing this training during orientation. They should do some general safety training. They don't know what training the driver has received prior to coming there. 
that they should start with a baseline level of training and then put that driver into their training rotation going forward. Every driver is getting a road test. Every driver is being sent for their physical and their drug screen. And the ones that are left at the end of the orientation process are taking out, they're introduced to their truck and they're, they're given a familiar, familiarization of the truck to, to make sure that they understand how it works, if there's any special equipment on it and, and that they're good to go. The big carriers don't have a lot of terminals. Uh, some of the big carriers, the Hunts and the Schneiders, have 10, maybe 11 terminals that spread around the country. So they're hiring from a wide geographical area. And that creates a lot of logistical challenges and a lot of costs to put together an orientation class. You're bringing drivers in from all over. Uh, I managed a hiring center for one of the large carriers that was based in, my terminal was in Pennsylvania. We hired drivers from Maine through the Carolinas. So it was quite an affair to get drivers to that terminal. You have lodging when they arrive. You have the shuttle back and forth from the hotel. You have shuttles back and forth to the clinics. You have meals during orientation. So it's quite a, a whole orchestrated affair to put together an orientation class. It's not cheap to put a driver on the payroll. You have about $250 of travel costs per driver. You have roughly $850, depending on the area of the country, for lodging and meals. Uh, $200 for physicals and drug screens and anything else related to that. Years ago, the DOT did a study of the cost effects and the impact on revenue of hiring a commercial driver, and they came up with a number of $750 per driver for everything from the recruiter's time to the processor's time through the HR department's time of about $750. So by the time you have a driver make it through orientation, you've invested over $2,000. Uh, dollars in that driver. So again, it's not, un, uh, it, it, it's not uncommon to have 30 drivers in class with some of the bigger terminals. That's 61,000 and change of cost per terminal per class. And many of these large companies will have this class going on at many terminals around the country. So they could have millions of dollars in, in hiring costs at each terminal per year. So every driver that gets dismissed from orientation can cost as much as $2,500 of lost expenses, money you've paid and you've got nothing for, and you still have that empty truck that's parked at the fence and is not earning any money. Who is responsible for filling these trucks? The recruiters they are typically paid a salary and a commission, and it's their job to put People in orientation, they go find the drivers, they, they, they do some pre-screen interviews with them and they get them in the door. Terminal managers are typically a salary position with some sort of profit sharing, but if their hiring costs are high and their hiring numbers are low, it means they have low tracker utilization and their, their, their profits for that terminal are down and that affects their pay and their bottom line. So both of these positions have compensation that's based on filling the trucks. So in our work, we've reviewed thousands and thousands of Q files. And again, my team and I have looked through many thousands more in, in industry. And there are things we find. Uh, we find disqualifying information that is changed or omitted. Sometimes experience levels are altered. So a company may have a one year minimum experience but that driver comes and turns out to have nine or 10 months, they may alter a date. Uh, past failed drug and alcohol test information could be omitted. Uh, minor or crashes from uh, former employers could be admit, uh, omitted or ignored. They, they, just, they, they don't bring that to the attention of a safety manager. Um, we found cases where employment background checks were simply faked. They, they did not happen, but there were uh, forms filled out to make it look like it happened. Um, we found cases where applicants were sent to a different clinic than is normally used by that terminal. The large carriers like using the chain, uh, the large chains that are out there like Concentra. So if you find that every driver in that fleet or every driver in that class went to Concentra except this one driver involved in your case and they were sent to a clinic down the road, that, that's a red flag to me that maybe there's something up with that driver and they could not pass a, a true physical, and there could be a medical condition that was 
uh, uh, somehow involving involve the crash. Uh, applicants who fail road tests are often given a second road test and a third road test and, and maybe more and maybe the, the road test is ultimately waived if uh, if the driver otherwise looks good on paper, maybe they're nervous and can't do the backing portion of the road test or there's something with it. Uh, you don't often see drivers released from orientation for simply pa not passing the road test. That's the one that amazes me because at the end of the day, we're hiring drivers to drive and the road test should be one of the more important parts of the screening process. We found cases where training documents have been altered. So what you're looking at here were two separate documents that we found in a case I worked years ago. The one on your right shows a date of May 9th, 2014. The trainer's name is Shane, and these are the people that attended that training module. But if you look, we have Shane with the same exact people in the same exact order. And if you look close, you can tell they're the identical documents. And all they did up here was white out the date and change the date. So they weren't doing training, but for the sake of record keeping and making it look like they had a good training program, they were falsifying training documents. And I discovered this, I gave it to my client who had it verified through a handwriting expert that these were indeed the same document and it's just been falsified in that case uh, settled very shortly after that. So my team and I, we, we've seen these things, we've seen it in industry, we've seen it as part of our casework. And it's important whether you're doing plaintiff work or defense work to do a good thorough examination of the Q file to find out where you stand. If, if you're doing defense work, you, you most likely want us to establish with you that the, the driver has a legitimate Q file and, and met all the qualifications. And if it's a plaintiff case, this is where we start to look for problems. And from here, whatever we find, we can react to and then plan a, a, an attack, so to speak, to help you further your case. So how do you catch this? Some of the things we've done is we've suggested to our clients to subpoena the Q file from this driver's previous employers. The data should not change. If a job this driver had three years ago was a nine month job, it should be a nine month job all the way through until who he's working for now. Uh, drug screen information should not change. Accident information should not change. But if you see changes, someone along the way falsified that information. And we can help you to determine if it was a prior employer or the employer involved in your case. We suggest you depose the on-site managers and the safety clerks. The safety clerks see the collected information. They know what is legitimate information and they know what is disqualifying information. And if there was someone that's telling them to hide or omit or falsify something, this is where you may find that. So whether we do plaintiff or defense work, we urge our clients to pull the Q file. I have a, a standard list of Q file materials that I can send you for uh, discovery purposes. All of my team does, and we're happy to, to give that to you to help you get a baseline start on your discovery process. Uh, from here, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Mark Respis, who's going to talk a bit about uh, the pre-screening of the driver. All of everybody on his team, uh, we're former drivers. We've moved into management positions. In my case, uh, started out with about nine years of over the road tractor trailer driving, all of that uh, accident free, about a, roughly a million miles, give or take. And then I was given the opportunity to move into a, a management role, a fleet safety management role dealing with regulatory compliance and hiring and training and, and crashes. Uh, I spent some time with an insurance carrier uh, in their loss control area. Uh, my positions over the years have included, you know, from recruiting on up through training, safety manager, director of safety, uh, up to senior director of safety. Before I got into trucking, I actually spent several years in law enforcement. So it was, it was kind of a natural flow to move from law enforcement into fleet safety. Uh, you know, it's that compliance uh, mentality. And, uh, you know, I still have my CDL in my rear pocket, as Brooks alluded to as well. So 
go on to uh, some pre-hire and screening and risk management topics. Uh, risk management and regulatory compliance help eliminate the unsafe driver. The goal is hire only safe drivers. Whether it's a large carrier, small carrier, whatever, the goal is just to hire safe drivers. Some, some carriers do a much better job than others, and we'll touch on that. Pre-screening. Uh, Pre-screening is important. There's a difference in pre-screening and uh, compliant, right? FMCSA compliant driver and pre-screening. So there, there's a distinct difference in the two. The FMCSA, the Federal Motor Carrier, they establish minimum standards for uh, driver requirements. And uh, these must be adhered to. Uh, a good risk management program, uh, you know, involves a company reviewing their operations and determining what level of risk uh, they're comfortable with. Uh, and some carriers take on more risk than others. A motor carrier should formulate a clear list of their minimum qualifications. It needs to be in writing and it needs to be followed. And you can't just willy-nilly hire drivers because you know they're somebody's best friend or they look good. Uh, so we go on to a little bit more about pre-screening. We'll talk about large carriers for a second. Large carriers are the J.B. Hunch, the Swifts, the, the uh, thousand plus fleets in most cases. They, they generally require a minimum of a year recent verifiable experience. It needs to be fairly recent. It needs to be something you can verify. If their experience was, if they had a couple years 10 years ago, and they've been working in a factory ever since, it's almost impossible to verify that experience. Company may not even exist anymore. Uh, you're looking at their driving record. So, you know, DUIs, DWIs, any drug or alcohol issues in the last five years. Uh, you look at their driving record, their citations, their moving violations. You wanna look at their accident history. You need to have maximums that you will accept. And, and this is part of your uh, employment eligibility requirements. Uh, large motor carriers, large motor carriers have the resources to do this better than say a small carrier. Large motor carriers, uh, they, they generally have dedicated people that do recruiting, they have dedicated people that do the processing and the background checks, uh, they have safety clerks that review everything. Uh, and it's a, they've got the staff and the experience to do a good job in most cases, you know, we still, we still have to, you know, as attorneys and as uh, a trucking expert, we want to review that file thoroughly, whether they're a large carrier or not. We can't just assume that they're going to do a good job. Smaller motor carriers present some different issues. They tend to assume more risk. Uh, they don't have the resources. They don't generate the, the revenue to be able to match the pay and benefits of the large carriers like your Schneiders and Swifts. Their fleets are generally older. Uh, a tractor today is $140,000, give or take. A trailer, anywhere from sixty to 75000 for a trailer. The, the newer, the larger fleets, uh, larger fleets, it goes back to resources. They will replace their fleets on a rolling cycle. Uh, a lot of times their fleets are no more than three or four years old, whereas uh, the older fleets, the small, excuse me, the smaller fleets, they, they're going to run, run the equipment and run it and run it and run it until it basically falls apart because they just don't have the resources to replace it. They're going to have freight that is not necessarily driver friendly. Uh, freight that larger carriers don't want their drivers dealing with. Uh, you know, driver must load and unload. Drivers want to drive trucks. They don't want to be manual laborers. Some of the challenges with smaller carriers, uh, they will hire less experienced drivers. They can pay them a little less. Uh, they, may, they may take on a driver that's been turned down by a large motor carrier. Uh, they may have questionable motor vehicle records or uh, work histories, uh, more accidents. So the, it has to do with the mom and, pop, mom and pop culture of a smaller carrier. They're just more susceptible. Uh, the employment application Federal Motor Carrier specifies uh, a driver application and, and specifies what has to be on that application. It's more, 
it's more in depth, it's more thorough than if you're hiring a person to work in your office and pay bills or a person to work in the shop and sweep the floor. A driver application is much more thorough. It goes into a lot more driver related tasks. Uh, you look for experience. Uh, you're looking at their accidents, their traffic citations, uh, any, any disqualifying information. And Brooks alluded to some of that earlier. You're looking for gaps. You, you want to look for gaps on an on a application. You know, when I review a file or when you're reviewing a file as an attorney, you want to know that that driver should or should not have been hired to begin with. Gaps have to be explained. You know, a long gap, somebody could have been in, in jail. Uh, we look at imp uh, a pattern of suspicious employers that are no longer in business. You know, trucking companies go out of business all the time. But if they're, all their work history is trucking companies that are no longer exist and they're out of business, it's almost impossible to go back and verify any of that. Uh, the important thing about a driver app, there, there's signed waivers, there's releases. You can't do any background checking, and this gets into the fair credit, but you cannot check their driving histories, their accident histories, drug and alcohol histories, uh, criminal backgrounds. You can't check any of this until you have these waivers signed by the driver. A driver should not be brought into orientation until they've submitted a completed application. Everything is done online nowadays, so that makes it fairly easy. Uh, these are things to look at before you bring a driver in for orientation. Uh, and as an attorney, you want to you want to make sure that the carrier that uh, you know whether you're on the defense or the plaintiff side is the carrier doing the right thing, or or are there some gaps that you can work with? Uh, driving record. You want to look at an MVR more than just the last three years that FMCSA requires, and then you want to look at multiple MVRs if they've lived in multiple states. You know, drivers have a tendency to move around. They could live in. They could live in Florida, they could live in Tennessee, they could live in Colorado, all over a five or six year, seven year period. And you wanna pull all those MBRs and look at them. You look for stuff that's hidden, you know, looking for that DUI that may not show up on their current MBR. Uh, look for patterns of many moving violations. Look for suspensions and suspensions, if there are suspensions because of driving history, driving that, uh, behavior, that's one thing. If, if it's because of maybe failure to pay child support, that's something totally different. You have to you know, take all this into consideration when you're looking at a record. Uh, criminal background checks, I mentioned that a minute, minute ago. FMCSA does not require criminal background checks, but most reputable carriers nowadays, that they are doing criminal background checks. Uh, it's, it's critical. Uh, you want to know who you're putting in a truck. And if you're an attorney, uh, you, you, need to know, you need to know much about this driver as you can, whether you're on the plaintiff or the defense side. We all know that probably most drivers, good, honest, hardworking people, but you know, they're not angels. But you may, you may uncover uh, a trucking company when they're hiring a driver. They, if they're doing a background check, they may uncover uh, maybe a criminal charge from years and years and years ago, you know, you can a lot of times chalk that up to somebody being young and stupid, but the important thing is, have they outgrown it? Uh, what do they look like now? Unacceptable criminal behavior depends on the situation. Uh, for example, a school bus driver, you, you, you don't want anybody on the uh, uh, sex offender registry driving a school bus, you know, interacting with children. Uh, if you haul high value freight, you know, flat screen TVs, computers, uh, any type of high value freight, you don't want to hire a driver that has uh, any type of a history of theft or robbery. And then crimes of violence. Uh, this is an issue. Some people just, just can't control their behavior. They can't control their temper. You know, do they get into altercations with customers? Uh, have they had fights at truck stops with other drivers? Uh, domestic abuse is something that is certainly worthy of looking at. In summary, uh, the FMCSA has minimum qualifications, but 
companies need to pre-screen and weed out the bad apples before they get to the point of qualifying them as a driver. If you're a defense attorney, uh, you're looking for solid risk management controls and are they only hiring good drivers? Uh, can you defend the carrier and the driver? If they've got solid controls in place and they're only hiring the best drivers, then this should be, uh, should be easy to defend. Uh, if you're on the plaintiff side, you're look, we're, we're gonna look for gaps. You know, we're gonna look for gaps in their program, weaknesses uh, that can possibly help your case. Then there's that question, should the driver have been hired to begin with? So proper hiring means proper vetting. Uh, meeting, becoming, uh, being FMCSA compliant, uh, having good risk management controls in place. There's an adage, we've all heard it, uh, trust but verify. You know, we like to trust people. We like to take them at their word, but we still have to verify. When we're talking about drivers and putting them in a $140,000 piece of equipment and a, a trailer and your load of freight, you Companies need to know who they're putting in there. Uh, just because a driver can be FMCSA qualified does not mean that the carrier should have hired them. And I, I like to go back to what I used to do. If my name is on the side of that truck, uh, would I be comfortable putting that driver in my truck with my freight and sending them down a road 70 miles an hour to interact with uh, the general public out on the highway. So these are things that we can help you with, uh, whether it's defense or planning, if we can help you go through these files and uh, are, they, are they good solid files, are they good solid companies or are they not? With that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Brooks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, to connect that to the overall topic of, of uh, keeping the unsafe driver out of the truck, pre-screening isn't a requirement but pre-screening allows you to catch the obvious problems before you bring them into your company and you, and you pay the cost to get them to your terminal. Because once they're there, there's a pressure and, and a, a temptation to keep them. So the, the obvious problems, the, 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 the deeper motor vehicle problems, uh, the, the drug and alcohol issues that the prior employers will tell you about, it, it, you can find this out once you have the completed application and the signed waivers on the application before you invest any more money in that driver. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. So again, for those that may have tuned in late, Tim Buzzer can't be with us here today. He's dealing with a client issue. Um, I helped Tim develop this niche practice of the non-CDL driver, and it's been a very successful uh, practice for Tim. I've done these cases as well, and I've had non-CDL drivers under my management. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the information. It, it's still valuable. And, and if you have cases that involve a, someone who drives for a living but is not a CDL driver, this could be helpful for you. So what exactly is a non-CDL driver? It's someone who drives for a living uh, but does not need a CDL. It's the <clears throat> cable TV guy that comes to your house. It's the pizza delivery guy. They drive vehicles that may or may not be commercial vehicles. So we know that a commercial vehicle uh, determination starts at 10,001 pounds, but the CDL doesn't kick in for most cases until 26,001 outside of some special circumstances. So again, the cable TV package, uh, package delivery driver, the, the pizza delivery driver, these are all people driving non-CDL vehicles, but they're still performing commerce this part of the industry is not regulated. There, there aren't things like Q files as, as we have for CDL drivers, but there are still standards that exist for the hiring of these people. So what do these fleets look like? <clears throat> Again, earlier this year, Amazon announced they put thousands of these small fleet package trucks on the street. And last year they, they made a big announcement where they were actually encouraging some of their warehouse employees to resign and become entrepreneurs and invest in these trucks. So we have people that worked in the warehouse, made an investment, bought a truck like this, and they're out there delivering packages for Amazon. You have taxi drivers. Taxi drivers are, 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 are uh, hauling passengers, but you do not need a special license to do that. 
and again, the, the pizza delivery driver. There are millions of these vehicles out there. Each of these drivers can be a uh, potential danger to others. And each of these drivers, no matter what they're driving, need to be vetted the same way we do our tractor trailer drivers. The hiring standards are basically the same. They should be the same. You want motor vehicle records on these people. You want to know about their accident history and their ticket history. There should be a drug and alcohol screening process in place for these people. Uh, a criminal background check. I know last year, a few of the ride share companies, um, people like Lyft and Uber, there were news reports, many news reports last year of these drivers uh, attacking and, and in some cases murdering their passengers. Uh, whether there was something in a background check that could have been found, we don't know, but you're still, you're, you're putting these people, uh, you're, you're putting these people out there that interact with the public and it would be the best standard of care to do the criminal background check on, on, on this group of drivers. There should be some level of defensive driver training. They're, they're logging more miles than the average person does in a car. And so the, the, the incident rates are potentially higher. There, there should be some level to make sure that these drivers have good basic driving skills. And of course, customer safety. If you have people that are dealing with customers, uh, you, you want to have that awareness training with them. One segment of this in particular are passenger transportation drivers, the taxi drivers, the limo drivers. So the, the top, photo of the limo with, with the, the, the high school kids, that limo needs a CDL driver. The, the capacity of that limousine is 14 passengers or more. The middle limo has a 10 passenger capacity. That vehicle does not need a CDL license. And of course the taxi, the one shown here, the sedan has a capacity of five people, but it doesn't matter whether they need a CDL license or not, all three of these drivers should be vetted in the same fashion. Tim did two very interesting cases uh, in, in recent history that I, I wanted him to present to you today that show the importance. The first one shows the importance of proper vetting and training. The defendant driver worked for a laundry service who picked up and delivered laundry all around the New York City area. Uh, he drove a van, a, a typical panel van, uh, no CDLs required. And one day he made a left turn at an intersection in New York City and struck and killed a plaintiff. Struck and killed a plaintiff. So what, what, what went wrong here? We were able to argue and, and, and help our client uh, put together a negligent hiring case here. The employer had a policy of only allowing three points on the driver's license. And although this defendant driver only had two points when they hired him, he spent most of the last seven years in jail for various drug and weapon charges. So his opportunity to drive was limited, uh, yet they did not do a criminal background check and didn't realize this. They saw someone who had two tickets, they thought it was reasonable and they hired him. And then after they hired him, the defendant driver went on and accumulated four more traffic tickets for running stop signs, running red lights, uh, blocking the intersections, and it accrued another eight points. The company had no training or retraining program. There was no disciplinary action taken and no work suspensions. So two years to the day after he was hired, he struck and killed the plaintiff. So along with the negligent hiring aspect, we were able to help our the client develop a negligent retention uh, argument on this case as well. The second case uh, involved a pizza delivery driver, the typical guy that comes to your house. Uh, uh, he's not driving a CDL vehicle. He doesn't have a CDL license. He's driving his own car. He's making a delivery one day and the, the rooftop pizza sign came dislodged from his car. It hit, went through the window of the windshield of an oncoming car and hit the driver in the neck. There's no training, no training on the proper way to install the sign or secure the sign or take care of the sign. But they did 30 hours worth of training with this guy on how to answer the phones and make pizzas. Uh, in doing more research into this company, 
we realized that they are also a major motor carrier. They have approximately 600 tractor trailers out there. And we were able to make the successful argument that they're parts of the federal motor carrier regulations that created a standard of care that was relevant to a pizza delivery driver. One was the duty of the employer, the employer to train the driver. And the second was the duty of the driver to secure any equipment that's attached to their vehicle. I'm sorry, let me back that up a second. So this driver was not a CDL driver, but we were successfully able to, and, and the, the case worked out very well. We're, we were able to show that there are parts of the federal motor carrier regs that are still critically important to the safety of vehicles in commerce. And, and th this case w went very well for Tim and his client. The takeaway from this is all drivers need to be trained, regardless of the license they hold or the vehicle they drive. They can all potentially be unsafe to the public. Um, they should be vetted, just like we do our tractor trailer drivers. And there are standards out there, Lyft, and Uber and the taxi commissions and Amazon and Comcast, all of these companies have recognized internal standards for hiring of, of people that drive their vehicles. And we can help you find those standards and apply them to your case. So with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to Jesse. Thank you, Brooks. Uh, before we move on from the non-CDL driver topic, Brooks, I, I think you know earlier in my career, um, I had a short stint as the fleet safety manager for a pharmaceutical company. And sure. in, in that role, we, we did you know, kind of the same thing. Uh, I was responsible for running motor vehicle record checks, conducting driver training, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, would positions like pharmaceutical reps and other sales professionals fit into this same umbrella of non-CDL drivers that, that you just spoke about? Absolutely, uh, Jesse. Many of the motor carriers I worked for had a fleet of cars that were used by the salespeople. Mm -hmm. We also had mechanics and, 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 and service vehicles that we would send out to pick up parts. Uh, we vetted those people, our salesmen and our mechanics, the same way we vetted our drivers. We had drug screen programs. They attended our training and we made that part of our, instead of running two separate programs, one for the non-CDL and one for the CDL, we ran them all as one program. Mm -hmm. We had a random program for our salespeople. Uh, we did defensive driving training with them. We did MVR reviews with them. And there were times when we limited their use of our vehicles and the salespeople were made to use their vehicles and reimburse us. And we would do a mileage reimbursement. They were still our agents and we were still responsible for them. But we, we, we tried to show a measure of taking a responsible step rather than just let these people continue to drive our vehicle. Mm -hmm. so, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, when we think about these non-CDL commercial vehicles, it, it, I mean, it's much bigger than those uh, Sprinter vans or, or even the panel vans. I mean, we could be talking about a Toyota Camry or a Chevy Impala, whatever it might be. Sure. Uh, depending well, on who the owner is, right? Sure, and, and, and so, so it's, it's late spring, we're getting into summer and uh, neighborhoods are seeing ice cream trucks. An ice cream truck does not need a CDL license, but what do they do? They, they attract children, children come running. And, and so we, we want those drivers to have some level of safety training. We mm -hmm. want them to be the safest drivers we can find for that position. So you don't think of the ice cream truck or the snowball truck as, as, a, as a dangerous vehicle, but it very well could be. So the standards apply there as well. That makes sense. Um, Brooks, we had a question that just came in asking if you had any comments on hiring temp drivers from a staffing company. Uh, and I, I know I'm catching you off guard with this one, but if, any thoughts on that? Sure. We, we've had many cases involving uh, temp services. Uh, temp services provide a good value to the transportation industry, and they provide the same flexibility that anyone who works for a temp service does. The motor carrier that uses that driver has the responsibility to make sure that driver is qualified. They can do that by reviewing the file from the temp service. 
Uh, most temp services will do the qualifications and provide that file to the motor carrier that's using that driver. Whether that happens or the, or the, the motor carrier decides to do the processing themselves, it falls on the responsibility of the motor carrier to make sure that driver is qualified, what any driver is qualified that they put in their truck. Yeah. The federal um, motor carrier, I'm sorry, just, just to, to another thought there. Yep. The federal motor carrier d doesn't make a lot of difference between um, a, a, a temp driver or a, a full-time employee driver. They talk about the commercial driver and the standards of the motor carrier in relations to a commercial driver. That makes sense. That's great. Um, Mark, let me throw a question your way. Um, we had a couple comments that came in through the email box. Um, as, it as it relates to the pre-screening process, it sounds like that's pretty stringent. And, and in your experience, you were pretty selective. Um, do you have any kind of, um, any concept of what the proportion of drivers who, who actually get through uh, in, in terms of the total applicants? Any, any background on that? Let me, let me first touch on, you know, you said stringent. It's stringent based on the individual carrier. So some carriers are much better than others and, and some, they don't do any pre-screening. They just bring a driver in and stick him in orientation uh, and hope for the best. But yes, pre-screening uh, is critical for a reputable carrier and in, in you know going back in, in my years doing it I did thorough pre-screening I wanted to weed out the bad apples before I went to the expense and time and trouble to bring them into orientation sometimes I have to fly them in or bus them in and hotels and meals I want to weed out the bad apple before I incur all that uh, on average this is an average. I probably hired less than 10% of all the applicants I looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's where pre-screening comes in. Why bring a guy in and then find out that you don't want it? So weed them out before you bring them in. Yeah, I mean, especially if it's going to cost you, as Brooks said, $2,050 per person you bring and, in. And the, the part of the problem with that, with some, some carriers, there's so much pressure to fill trucks. Mm -hmm. if, if Once they've got the driver in orientation, he may turn out to be one of those that maybe we shouldn't have brought in, but you're going to roll the dice and keep him because you've already, you're already invested in him. So now you're going to keep him and cross your fingers and put him in a truck. And, uh, you know, again, there's a lot of pressure to fill trucks and, but, you know, my philosophy is, yes, we're going to fill trucks, but we're going to put the right drivers in those trucks. Yeah. Jesse, if I may. Of course. Um, the, I want to stress home the point that, that just because a driver can be federal motor carrier qualified, that does not make them an acceptable risk. It's, it's, you'd be amazed at how, how liberal the, the, the regulations are and, and how little bit, well, the best way to say is that, that there's a very small uh, number of regulations that, that, that give me reason to, to disqualify a driver. You could have a driver with a long list of, of moving violations, a long list of accidents, but if they maintain a license and that license was allowed to be, uh, 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 or was, was not suspended or revoked, that driver could be qualified. You could get a driver that's been fired from every job he's worked at. Uh, he could still be qualified. You could get a driver that walks right out of the motor vehicle office with a brand new license in their, in their hand. That doesn't mean, yes, that driver could be qualified, but that doesn't mean that that, that driver is a good hire. That, that's where your risk management program comes into play. You know, the brand new driver has done nothing wrong but who wants to be the first patient on the operating table with a brand new surgeon? You know, that driver needs to go somewhere else to get some experience before I'm willing to look at them. Right. They've also done nothing right so far. Um, Correct. Other than get their license, which I guess is not, is, it's not nothing. Um, we're going to try to try to feel at least one more question before we, before we run out of time. Brooks, we had a question about Uber and Lyft. 
and their use of independent contractors as drivers. Um, I think I know how you'll answer this, but, but does using an independent contractor change at all the company's responsibilities for ensuring their qualifications and training, et cetera, et cetera? No, you still have agency there. And I, I know that, so me and my team, we follow the, these companies in the news and we see what they're involved in. And there are several cities that have uh, taken them to court because Lyft and, and Uber did not want to uh, do any qualification with their drivers. They didn't want to have to pull MVRs and they didn't want to have to have those them registered with the different cities. Uh, if you're putting a driver behind the wheel of a vehicle, even if it's their vehicle, it's our opinion and it's held up that you are responsible for the actions of that driver. And there's a minimum standard of care that you must follow, which is the vetting and the training. And the, the drug screening and is, is something that we all uh, heavily encourage because it, it, it just, it's a way to screen out drivers with other undesirable behaviors. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the short answer to that is, yes, Uber and Lyft are still responsible for these people. Uh, even if they are independent contractors. Yeah, yeah, that's what I would have imagined as well. And I mean, I, I think your opinion on all of this comes from the fact that you're first and foremost safety conscious, right? That, that was your first concern as a trucker, as a safety manager, safety first, and, and everything else follows. Um, let's see if we can do one last question here. I, I love the fact that we're getting a lot of questions coming in. Um, we had an anonymous attendee ask um, about the ongoing uh, monitoring and management of drivers after they're hired. So we do all this pre-screening and then we hire them and we've touched on this. Looks like you've got a cat visiting you there, Brooks. Um, but uh, what do we do after the, after the driver's hired to make sure that they stay safe? Sure, so uh, th there are several things motor carriers should be doing. Um, the regulations require they do an annual review of the driver's record. So once a year, they pull a new MVR. They should be doing accident reviews. If the driver's involved in any action or even a complaint, a, a motorist complaint, there should be a review process. There should be some sort of remedial training. If you have a driver that begins to have a, a, a rash of backing accidents, you bring them in, they work with a trainer in the yard to, to, to hone up their, their backing skills. Or if they're having turning accidents, you may have them check for vision issues and make sure that their mirrors are adjusted right. So there are many remedial measures that motor carriers take. We've known about these for years. Um, some motor carriers have even taken to, to uh, using some of the services out there that will notify the motor carrier when one of their drivers receives a citation. It's like a credit reporting service, but for motor vehicle infractions. 